Are we on? Am I on? I can't tell. Oh no, the, the little green thing. Okay. Yeah, it says I'm live. Hey, hi guys. <laughs> uh, I haven't used Google Hangouts before, uh, so I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing. I figure it would be easier than vocal for those of you who have been around for the vocal ones before. Um, you can watch this on YouTube, too. Apparently, it's live streaming at the same time. Uh, I'm here by myself. I made Lino leave. So, okay. I'm going to close this. And I hope you guys can still hear and see me. What am I seeing? Aha! Aha! There! I killed it. <laughs> I had the YouTube channel up because I was trying to like hear what was going on. Um, let me see if I can figure out a way to actually see you guys on on G+, because I don't want to miss out any questions there. Uh, you think I would have tested this before before I actually did it, but no, I didn't. One viewer, who's viewing? Wish I could see the little chat. Oh, there's a chat. Hi, there's a chat. Oh, I can't chat with you unless it's on the unless you're on the thing. Let me see the Q and A. Opening Q and A. Ha! I am excited. That must be Kylie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's Kylie. Hi, Kylie. Uh, we got we got three viewers. I'm drink the the lady at at the movies when we went to go see Planet of the Apes had a bunch of these left over from their kids packs that they weren't selling anymore and she gave it to us for free and now I'm drinking Johnny Walker out of it just so <laughs> three viewers four viewers. Select. Currently answering. Done. Oh, awesome. Okay. So when you guys ask questions in the Q&A box, it'll pop up, and it'll show me whether or not I've actually answered it so I can mark them off as I go. So, yeah, feel free. Nick. <laughs> Nick says, what is this? I don't even. It's technology. Woo. I don't even either, so don't feel bad. I'm here, too. Hi, Tess! Yay! I'm glad you made it. <laughs> Eddie, all caps, woos. Done. Is this chat or just Q&A spot? I don't think you can chat with each other unless it's in the comment section on the, underneath the thing on the event page. I'm looking at a different screen, so it's hard for me to say. Um, the Q&A box is, just goes to me. So, um, yeah, so it's, you can chat direct to me through that, uh, and then I can, I can mark them on and off. Dave March, cooking. All right, seven viewers. Let me check the Facebook page and, and see what's going on. Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, I'm going to close Twitter. Twitter is a time hole. Jess Lee is on her way. Cooking, 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 cooking. Okay, I don't think we have any new questions there yet. Oh, crap. Let me see if they, there's anything else here. Megan. Okay, all right, all right, all right. For real this time. <laughs> Zach lives. Hooray. <laughs> All right. So it looks like we have two viewers, but I think that's just people who are are logged in. Can everybody hear me okay? Can somebody tell me in the QA box if you can hear me okay? The picture quality is way better than I thought. Okay. All right, yeah, so everybody can see your questions. <laughs> don't don't you know don't behave badly. All right. Yes. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, yes, Eddie. This is this is my writing space. This is my desk from IKEA, and you can see my the calendars that I taped to it. And I 
I've been peeling them off, and and it's my publishing calendar. Um, the uh, all the stuff, and you can you can see the the cover for Cora Riley hanging on my wall. And uh, yeah, like my computer is facing towards my desk because if I fa put my computer on my desk and faced it out, you would be looking down my galley kitchen, and that's that's not what you want. <laughs> Yay, Jessie's here. Huzzah. Everybody says it sounds good. Uh. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> All right, Joe, you'll be here. Hooray. Okay, everybody can hear me. Hi, Megan. Done. I'm not wearing any underpants, so how do you like that, Jess? <laughs> Okay. All right. It's five after, and everyone on the internet now knows I'm drinking scotch and not wearing underwear. So we're off to a good start. Good start. Um, I have a list. Oh, and we're up to ten viewers. Excellent. Um, I keep looking at my own face in the viewer instead of up at the camera like I'm supposed to. Sorry. Um, okay. So I have a list of questions. I had three people leave questions in various places, and so I'm going to try to get to those as best I can. There's like five, six, seventy-nine of them. Um, and but please go ahead and but not chat. So I'm back in my notes. Okay. Um. So go ahead and leave me some questions. And if I if I answer a question that you have while you're typing it out or anything, you can actually cancel your own questions in the Q and A box. Uh. Just just so you know. So um, I just want to say real quick before we get started, I'm super excited about how well the Patreon campaign did. I know several of you that are in the chat right now um, are, are contributing, and can I just say how much you guys blew my mind? I was just so excited. I was so nervous switching over to to a, a patronage system because you know you worry about these things. It's like asking for money is really weird, and it's not how it's not how writers make money, and but I for those of you who have followed me around since I, I was doing life coaching, which of which we will not speak, you know that I'm super I'm su I super believe in the power of community. Like I believe in the team, and so it just seemed to go together really well. And you early adopters have really just have have won my heart. You've you've shown me that this this will work. And as long as I keep looking at it long term, then we can keep having cool stuff like this, and I can get to know you guys, and we can build a better community. And then I'm supported, and you're supported, and then there's better books. Uh, so so yeah, I just I just want to say that real quick before we get started and start talking about all the the writing questions that people have <laughs> asked me. Okay, all right. Um, all right. So I'm gonna start with Allison's question first. She had some questions about, um, I, actually, every question that I got was about writing. You guys don't have to ask me writing questions. It's literally an ask me anything. So if, like, I think Katie asked me about pie, which I will answer later. Uh, but you can at, literally ask me anything. As long as it's not gross or super intrusive, I'm happy to answer. Um, Allison's first question says, chapter or section outlines? Do you always use them? Do you have a set format for them? And what's the biggest reason you find them helpful? So I I used to be a total pantser, where you, you fly by the seat of your pants and you don't plot. You have plotters and pantsers. It's, it's like the nature versus nurture argument. And I found that really frustrating. I, I hated not knowing where I was going because it was so slow. And, but I, I didn't want to map out every little detail and, and have these super dense, outlines because then I felt like I was hemmed in. I felt like I'd made a box that I couldn't get out of. And when you're writing that first draft, especially if you're doing stuff like word sprints where you're under a time and you've just got to go, 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 shit comes out that you didn't expect, stuff that didn't wasn't in the plan, and then you have to adjust or you freak out. And so what I wound up doing was I write a meta arc. So there's like anywhere between 5 and 20 points that I really want to make sure get touched on in the whole book itself. But then, instead of like breaking it down in chapter outlines from the very beginning, I'll sit down chapter 1, and then I'll write out 
the, the arc for that chapter, which is about 3,000 words. And then once I finish that, then I, I mentally have a stepping stone in the right direction so that I can write the second chapter outline right before I write it. So that it's sort of like a, it's a roadmap, but it's altering what happens in the next chapter. So it's, it's kind of a half and half. And the reason it's still useful to outline instead of, instead of just running with it, which I know is what a lot of people do, is that I have a record of what I wanted to happen that I can compare with what actually happened later. So if I missed something or I needed to change something around, I can do that. Also, if I get interrupted, I remember what I was doing later. So it's, it is helpful to outline, but you, it's, not a, it's not an all or nothing thing. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Zach says, what coffee are you drinking this time? The German chocolate one you recommended last time turned out nicely. Um, we stopped going to that store, and so we've been, I'm embarrassed to say we've been drinking Folgers in the French press. And I, I'm absolutely mortified by that, but it was a money situation, and um, we, we recently decided to up our game, so we, we bought a grinder, and uh, then the place next to us that sold banana cream coffee, just flavored beans, decided they were going to not sell it anymore. And so we bought a whole bunch of it. So now we're saving it for um, like special occasions. <laughs> but otherwise, we're buying better high quality beans, but they're not flavored. They're nothing fun. Sorry. Um, Kylie wants to know who my favorite Pokemon is. <laughs> Hers is Rapidash. Fire Unicorn for the win. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know if I'm embarrassed or proud to say that I never got into Pokemon. Um, I would occasionally watch it on Saturday mornings because it was on, but I, I, didn't, I didn't really get into it. Basically, the ones that I like are the cute ones, like, you know, Pikachu and, and Squirtle. But I don't, I don't know anything about Pokemon. I'm sorry. But a fire unicorn did sound pretty awesome. Uh, and he wants to know how I structure my day. Uh, it's kind of it's been an evolving process right now, um, because I'm in revisions for so, sort of souls. It's different than when I'm I'm doing first drafts, which is probably not unusual for most writers that your your system is different depending on what phase you're you're in. Um, uh, Hang on, hang on. I'm not doing this right. Um, so right now, I'm getting up at like 6 o'clock in the morning because that's when Lino gets up to go for a run. So I have a leisurely morning where I, I get up and I do the dishes and I make breakfast and I do coffee and I you know, play my iPad games and do the crossword. And then about 8 o'clock, I sit down and I, I check my Facebooks, so I check my email, do little admin stuff until about 9. And then I've been sitting down to do editing work. Um, that's usually when I do writing. I do all my writing in the beginning of the day. I find that about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, I just kind of run out of creative steam. So I try to structure my day where the, it's all front-ended with writing. And then after I have lunch and have that break, then I go into stuff that doesn't come out of the same tap. So I'll do blog posts if I'm still feeling energetic, or I'll do email responses, I'll do Facebook, all that kind of stuff, marketing stuff. Um, phone calls, that's, you, you know, about 3 or 4 o'clock is, you know, I'll take a nap. I don't know. <laughs> but I try to be more productive in the morning, especially since I'm getting up earlier now. I used to get up at 7 or 7.30. Uh, so it's, it, 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 when I'm drafting, I will almost take the whole day to do, like, my work day goes until about 4 o'clock. So I, sometimes, if I'm on a roll, I'll just go till 4, but I almost never write at night. Like, I, I try to be really good about maintaining boundaries between my work and my, my personal life in, in that way. Like, there's other ways that I don't. But, you know, Luna gets home at 5.30, make dinner, we eat dinner, we watch Supernatural, is what we've been watching recently. You know, I'll watch him play Mass Effect, we, you know, or we go out, we have time together in the evening. So I try to break it up. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Joe says that she will send me delicious coffee beans. I will accept that gift. I receive that. I will. I will take that. We we will talk. <laughs> banana and coffee. Yeah, but you, yeah, banana coffee doesn't sound 
really good until you like seriously start to think about it. <laughs> and it's absolutely delicious. You get it with some, like some good heavy 18% cream and some brown sugar. And especially if it's ice, that's 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 a winner right there. Come on. Come on, you can do it, Google. Um okay, uh Dave March says your series has a certain mythology rules for magic. How do you keep everything consistent? Do you have a magic logic Bible? <laughs> I should. I, I should, and I keep thinking that I'm going to actually sit down and, and write one so that I don't lose track, especially as we're getting into like a third book in this setting and there's going to be five books in this particular series plus the number zero. And then I want to have other authors come in and write in the new world so those rules and physics really do need to be laid down but the short answer is no I don't have one um, I know what it is and it's difficult almost to articulate it in in dry encyclopedia style terms and um, my my evil mastermind on call and current you know this time beta reader Dave LaRush has has been really helpful in in helping me figure out how to put words to that and how to explain it and keep things consistent. Um, so maybe someday soon, LaRush and I will sit down and and help help he'll help me work out the plot bible. So LaRush, you you've just been told in public. <sighs> um, Megan says. Do you hold on to stories? Do you hold on to stories from real life experiences to incorporate into your writing? Yes, absolutely for sure. It was like it was a major revelation to me that I could do that. I I had always believed that you pull on your life experiences and things that you know about people and yourself and places that you've been when you write in fiction, but for some reason, it hadn't occurred to me that I could literally take those memories and transplant them into a book until right before I started to write Cor Riley. In, in fact, the, the car accident that happens at the beginning of Cor Riley is, the car, is a car accident that I was in. When I was 18 years old, I was on my way to go pick my brother up from school and fishtailed on a rural highway and rolled the truck three times, landed on the roof. I really like I had that moment where I was like, I'm gonna die here. This is this is it. Like my glasses flew out the window, and but I was okay. Like obviously it went differently for me, um, but it was. I was like, I this is such a powerful experience, and I wanted to use it because it's a great transformation. Um, but it was actually really difficult to write. I was traveling with Lino. We were in Cleveland in a hotel room while he was working and I was having to write that write the car accident and it was you know it, w it had been more than 10 years and I was having trouble writing it that scene is no more than 500 words and it took me a, a day and a half to write because it was just so painful to remember so you can use those experiences but if it's stuff that you haven't actually dealt with the translation between having lived it and trying to make someone else live it can be really rough. There's a lot of psychology going on in there. But on the brighter side, you have stuff like you get to draw on your first kiss and it's whether that was funny or traumatic or wonderful, like you get to, to pull on that stuff. And so when I go to write Ganglia Club, eventually, which is based in a high school, I get to pull on all my memories of high school, which is really going to be incredible, and end of college because I did some crazy stuff in college. So yeah, definitely use real experiences. Yay, Tina managed to log on. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I get questions from people who haven't answered questions from yet. Uh, Nick Connolly says, I'm an avid oral storyteller. I use a combination of check out input and improvisation to make my best stories. Mm -hmm. However, I tried a novel. Do you have any tips for including my process into writing a novel. Mm. Mm. I think all of those those points that you mentioned, like checkpoints, like having certain milestones that you have to hit. Um,
you you're drawing on like like what we were just talking about about your own experiences. Um, that's that's excellent. It helps you like add add some reality to your story. And improvisation. That's what, what I was talking about earlier, where you just kind of write stuff and things happen. That's what authors talk about when they they say their characters did something that they didn't expect. It's because your brain is cranking on a different cylinder, and you just put that in there, and it goes places you didn't you didn't want it to, or didn't think it would go, and you just kind of got to roll with it because usually those moments are the best ones in your story. So it sounds like your storytelling techniques are exactly what you need to write a good novel, and really the only difference between what like the the system that you're using, the system that I use, is the way that it, the way that we process it. Like I'm writing it down, and you're you're speaking it out loud. So you might experiment with with writing it down, or even taking um, like voice memo, voice memos, or video recording or something to walk yourself through it, and then go down and go back and write down the notes so that you can see what that process looks like on paper. So I'm not sure if that's helpful. Let me know if you have like more questions about that. I'll try to try to answer. Do, 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 do. Shanae, ah, hi. I look professional. Ha ah, ha That's hilarious. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna Jo 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 Jo. Yes. Okay. So Jo, pursuant to the the question about whether or not I have a a magic logic bible. Joe says, another writer friend of mine had her fans write her wiki. They had a better handle on her logic than she did. That is something I'm really interested in. Not only am I super a super supporter of fan art and, and fan fiction as like a show of love and understanding of an author's work, I think stuff like that is absolutely vital. That sort of feedback that, that the translation between what I think I write and what you read is that that pipeline is the entire point of storytelling, is making sure that, that the two ends match up. And so I would love it if, especially after Sword of Souls comes out, maybe what we'll do is, you know, part of the, the patron um, activity stream is, is to start um, a project together that that do, that makes that magic bible May, instead of just doing it my way source it like let's let's do it together maybe that would be um that sounds like a lot more fun and you know less work for me um but yeah i would love to hear how people perceive the magic system in in forgotten relics because i have a specific idea of what it is but i know that what you guys are picking up is different like your assumptions and what you bring to the table are not the same and so like in the in the interest of community, I'm curious about how how other people are are seeing that system. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the question list really quickly. Um, let me make sure I cross these off so I don't I don't double dip. Okay, David Scott says, where do you think writer's block comes from? Is it purely a psychological issue, or do other factors? physical, metaphysical, or otherwise, cause it to manifest. So back in the day, this will make Kylie very happy, back in the day, I participated in something called the World Changing Writers Workshop. It ran for three years, four years? I can't remember. Um, but I, I, I went every year. And one of the great things that I took away from the last year um, that, that I actually was a, a, a student instead of part of it, was that uh, plumbers don't get plumbers block. That writing and creative work is the only time that we talk about getting blocked in that way, where it's like, oh, I cannot work. My muse has abandoned me. And if, if a plumber said that, you'd be pissed. And I think it speaks a lot to our attitudes about what constitutes real work. So to me, writer's block is, is, is something inside of us. It's, in my mind, it's fear. It's I'm afraid that what I'm doing isn't good enough. I'm afraid to let go and, and just run with this story and see where it is. Um, I'm afraid to be successful. I'm afraid to share this. I don't really want to write it. Um, 
it's 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 a it's an evil little demon that lives inside of us. Um, and so yeah, I, mean, I, I think it, it's all of those things. It's psychological. It's it's a physical thing because I certainly have a physical reaction to it. No, I'm immune. Like I have literally, um, like there people, if you find the role, they will tell you that I have had cry meltdowns, throwing my stuff around, sitting up against the back of the couch on the floor, like crying because I can't do it. But Inevitably, what happens with writer's block is that you either give up the project altogether, you set it aside, get some space, because for me, it's because I'm too close to it, I'm trying too hard. Or you push through it, you keep working, you discipline your ass off, and you just keep going. Maybe you have to skip that scene. Maybe you have to start in a different place. Maybe there's something wrong with the things that you've already written and you need to go back and do a read through and find out where you are. Maybe you're just lost. Um, but it's not, it is not an excuse to stop working. Because it's, it's always something. Writer's block is a signal to you that something is wrong. Absolutely 100% for sure. But, you know, it's, it's it's one of the hazards of the profession, and if you're if you're going to get serious about it, you have to either learn to make friends with it, learn how to recognize it, or learn how to push through it. So I I get I get pissy about that because it's that 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 one phrase writers you know writers get writers block, plumbers don't get plumbers block. Like let's let's be realistic about that. Um, do 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 do. Uh, okay, let me clear some of these. Some of these are comments. Um, and he has so many questions. Uh, Shanae says that the video froze. Um, I'm not seeing that. Um, I'm sorry. Maybe check over on YouTube. It's playing on my channel, so I'm not sure if maybe it's over there. Might be your connection. I, it seems to be okay over here. What's the story? No, the buffering. Clear, 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 clear. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tina says, "Have you ever been afraid to finish a story?" Um, I don't know. Like, I don't think, I don't think afraid to finish. Has ever been a problem? I've certainly been afraid to start. Um, I get a lot of resistance. Like once I start to do something, I get pissed when I feel like I can't finish it. I don't like having loose ends. I don't like leaving leaving stuff flapping in the wind. So I get I get really aggressive about finishing stuff. But afraid to start has been a problem. Um, Usually because I'm afraid of the workload. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm curious about why why you asked that. Like, if if you could give me a little follow up there. Like, what where where does that come from? Like, what what are you afraid to finish? Like, what are you what are you really asking me? I guess is is what I want to know. So I'll, I'll wait for that to come around. Let me answer some of these other questions first. Um, Eddie says, since I have spurned Pokemon, what <laughs> video games are inspirational to you? Um, I, I really fell in love with the, the storytelling style in Fable. I've play, I haven't played the first one, but I, I played two and three. And I've been really enamored of Fallout and Mass Effect, which I haven't played uh, any of the games in those series, but I've, I've watched people play through them, so I'm familiar with their stories and, and their little tropes. Um, and I've, I've always been a big Final Fantasy fan. Um, I'll, I'll probably get, get checked on that, but like I spent, I spent 110 hours in Final, Final Fantasy XII. I, I love when a world isn't afraid to laugh at itself. Things like Elder Scrolls, um, they just take themselves too seriously. Like, I'm laughing watching people play Skyrim because it's so serious. And I can't, I can't, I just can't do it. I mean, you guys know me. I'm just not that person. 
Um, and like Super Mario RPG, I really liked because it's a classic storyline, but uh, you've got some shifting around of, of tropes, and you've also got a world that's not afraid to laugh up at itself. Um, same with like Lost Vikings, um, and like I, I obviously like I like platformers and I like RPGs. <laughs> so Donkey Kong, there we go. Programmers do get coders block, by the way. I bet they do. And it's probably because they left an open parenthesis somewhere. Um, Kylie wants to know what the print is behind my head in the white frame with the adorably funky lettering. Oh, okay. That is, it actually, if my camera was turned around, it says Ellison. So every, every letter is a different picture. Uh, my aunt brought me that back from China when she, the first time that she went. So I must have been 10 or 12. But yeah, so it says my name. It's one that I, I own very few pieces of actual fine art, and that's one of them. Do, 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 do. Um. Sorry. I think somebody, do we have two of these? I don't know. Okay. Uh, Shanae wants to know... Uh, how often I write and if I have a routine every day. How much do I write every day? So many questions. <laughs> um, so I covered a little bit of it earlier. Uh, I, I, I don't write every day because I right now am trying to build a stable foundation where I can work on one project and learn the cycle of it where its ups and downs are. Um, so right now I'm, I'm figuring out how to write one novel a year. And uh, what that has meant this year is that I didn't write at all in January. I wrote a little bit in February. I wrote nearly all of the draft of Sword of Souls in March. So it's like 70K. Um, but then I did some editing in April and in May. And then I sent it out to reviewers in June, to, to my beta readers. And I didn't write anything. <laughs> like all I did was all I did writing wise was uh, a couple of blog posts and the the short fiction that the the backers get. Um, so I don't write every day, and I feel guilty about that if I'm being honest because I know that we have a few people in the chat right now like Jessly and um, and Eddie Webb that that do, that, that write every day, they write multiple projects. Somebody in here, let me just kind of roll that in, is, you know, that juggle multiple projects, and I haven't figured out how to do that yet. So rather than beating myself up about it and forcing myself to crank out more and more work by writing on a new project when one project is, is resting, I try to focus on other things instead, like marketing, like I revamped the website, I started this Patreon campaign, I'm, I'm doing stuff with conventions, like I have a convention tomorrow here in town, um, things like that. And so, but my goal is that next year I'll, I'll write two books and because I'm, I'm learning how, how to do that. So then I probably will be writing every day because while one book is resting or with beta readers, I'll be working on another one. So, uh, da, 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 da. Dave Mart, yeah, yeah, L.A. Noir was really amazing. I didn't play it, but I watched um, a friend play through it, and it really is fantastic. Um, I would like to play through that one myself. Um, Zach asks if if I still engage in tabletop RP or LARPing. I maybe some of you guys don't know this, but I used to be an avid an avid member of the Camarilla, so I was doing live action role play for about six or seven years, which is how I, I met Zach. Um, and I, I kind of grew out of it. And it's not something I like to talk about in public, like why I left. Like the time that I spent there was amazing. I met some of the most incredible people and was part of some truly amazing examples of collaborative storytelling and characters and it was it it really did fuel my ability to tell a story on the spot because you 
you have to know your character and you have to know the characters that you're involved with in order to in order to to make that story work um, the problem I, I wound up having was we got you know there there's always drama in any organization there's always drama and by the time that I had started writing novels I realized that I was creating my own worlds and maybe it's a control issue I don't know but I started needing the cam less and less in order to to do that and so I, I wound up dropping out I'm actually I haven't renewed my membership this year so I'm, I'm out even though we are having the Canadian National Convention here two blocks from my house so I'll see you guys if you come and I would love to hang out but um, I'm not playing anymore um, Wow, you guys have a lot of questions. Okay, Eddie, I see your question about self-publishing, and I'm totally going to oh, answer Sherlock Holmes' question. Eddie, stop asking so many good questions. Jeez. Um, Tina, I hope I answered your question about having too many projects at the same time, because I, I know that that is something that I tend to do, and then I freak out because I'm not finishing them properly or my quality is bad, and so I'm trying really hard not to do that. Um, Megan says, do you find it easier to work from home or going out to a coffee shop? I, you know what, somebody asked me this actually recently about whether or not, like, I, I would consider working, like, in an office. And I have done time working in a creative space, like, the big open office where there's a bunch of other people. And I think I'm just too... I don't know, I'm too bitchy, or I'm too introverted, or I get too focused on what I'm doing, but I find that I can't, unless we have an agreement that 30 minutes or whatever amount of time we're not going to talk to each other, I can't focus long enough to work. So going out and working in a busy place, unless I'm alone, it's really difficult for me. So I've, I've developed a good routine at home. Um, I've worked at home since I was tw no, 19. I got a job really early on with an online tutoring company my first year of college. And so I, it, I've, it's been rare that I've worked a job where I had to go outside and put on pants. Put on pants and go outside. So working at home is really good for me. I know it's not for everybody. I know that a lot of people struggle with it. And, you know, it does have its costs. Like, it's hard. I'm not a great socializer. Um, so sometimes I do go, sometimes I'll go to the library if I need a, a change of place, if I'm having trouble with writer's block. Um, or it's just, you know, or if I haven't been out of the house in a week, I should probably go outside. Because that happens. Uh, okay, so Tina updated her question about being afraid to finish a story. She says, are you afraid of what readers will think of your stories or worried the end will turn out to be awesome? <laughs> Do I worry that the end will be awesome? Um, have you ever been scared to write something because people would think you were too crazy or over the top? All the time. All the time. Because it's... I don't even know how to describe it. Like, It's one of those things that's kind of taboo to talk about in writing circles from what I can tell. Like, um, it, it, it is scary. Like you're not supposed to care what readers think and you're just supposed to write the truth of your story but it's a a it's a business you know you want people to like your stuff so that the, that you can continue to do it and 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 make more and, and support yourself but it's also to me it's like because I have such a close you, you know you guys are part of a very tight-knit community like I've had people tell me they don't understand why my my numbers aren't bigger because you guys are so amazing and you're you're dedicated and you're intense and you're into it like look at the questions you're asking and the support that you give is so incredible that the worry that I have is letting you guys down like there's there's a big difference between like whacking a character that everybody loves because it's part of the story because there that can be forgiven as long as the story is good but if I fail you on the plot if I fail you on the message, if I fail you on the tone, the theme, if I change characters midstream, like, I'm familiar with fandom. 
and I know how vicious it can be. And I don't want that. I don't. I don't. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be, you know, I want to be Joss Whedon beloved, not Mark Gaddis hated. Like, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um. I, 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 I get afraid that I'm not doing right by you. I'm never afraid to finish. I'm not afraid that it's going to be too awesome. I do get afraid of doing crazy stuff because sometimes I am worried about what people think it says about me. Like if I if I write a torture scene, what do people think about me as a person? Um, but I honestly, my big fear about turning out work and showing work to you guys is that you won't like it because I, I don't want to let you down. I don't want you guys to be disappointed. So, tear. <laughs> Ah, Sam Hooker. Hello. Do you have any tips or experiences you can share for someone wanting to start writing as a hobby? You know what? That is strangely not a question I get very often. Most of the people that ask me for getting started on writing are asking me about professional stuff. Like, how do you how do you break in? How do you make it a career? Um, which I'm just terrible for that kind of advice. Um, but a hobby, you got... The, the advice is strangely quite the same. Um, you you have to make time, and you can write about anything you want. I started getting into writing practice by doing the the um, the artist's way thing where you write 700 words about three pages longhand. I was doing it on the computer, but uh, just starting by carving out that time, whether it was at the beginning of the day, middle of the day, the end of the day, whatever, as long as it got done because you, you start to build up a habit and you start to treat it with respect. And just like any hobby, you, you have to spend time with it. You, you can't have a hobby if you don't do it. And I think that's a pitfall that a lot of creatives fall into is that they, they think that because they like something or that they, they want to have written, as Terry Pratchett has said, um, they, they say that they're writers or they say that that's their hobby, but if you ask them what they write or what their what their writing practice is, they don't have an answer. So, like, practically speaking, the tip is you got to write. And even if it's just five minutes, even if you get a little stupid writing prompt like, um, like they did when we were in high school, like I had an English class where every day there was a, a sentence on the board, a question or a makeup of this, and we had... 10 minutes at the beginning of English class to just write in our little composition notebooks just to do it and it it helps you establish a practice and it, it should be fun like don't punish yourself if it's just a hobby like you start punishing yourself if it's if it's gonna be a career and you really need to get some discipline but if it's a hobby approach it with love you know approach it from a, a fun perspective this is supposed to be something you do for enjoyment so don't just don't shit on yourself too much. Oh my god. Eddie says on multiple projects, I have a whiteboard, a Trello board, which is a an online organizational tool that I never figured out. And seven years experience juggling multiple projects. It's a learned skill. Yeah, I'm trying to learn it. I I'm getting better. Like I have because I'm doing the novels and the monthly short stories, but I drop blogging. Um not all together, just whenever. Um, but it is something I'm trying to learn how to manage. Pants are overrated. I, I agree. I am wearing pants, by the way. I know you can't see them, but they're there. Um, fresh air is your friend. I know. I need to go outside. At least I keep the patio door open. Uh, ever have the moment where you're reading your words a year later going, holy crap, did I write that? That's brilliant. <laughs> I do have that, and again, it's another taboo sort of subject that you're not supposed to be like, oh my god, I'm amazing. But I had occasion to go back and look through Ink Changer. I'm pointing over there because that's where my library is. Um, I went to go look through Ink Changer to look something up because it was actually, because I'm so familiar with the format, it was quicker than searching for it through Word and waiting for all the programs to open. And I was like reading along, and I just I kind of got caught up in it, and I was like, this is not only is this good, but it was my first book. Like I'm actually pretty proud of this. And like later that day, I had somebody send me an email saying they just read it for the first time after the the Amazon free day, and they were just like, "This is so amazing!" And it's 
it's things like that that we tend to discredit because we think that we're being conceited or or where you know we lapse immediately into self-deprecation but it's you got to hold on to that it it helps bring you through when you think that all is lost it helps pull you through those sections of writer's block because sometimes those those passages that you're like wow this is really amazing are the ones that were the hardest to write uh, hmm. Do you think starting with short stories would be an easier way to get into writing rather than a full-blown novel? It totally depends on your goals because writing a short story is not the same as writing a novel. Um, because it, it's much faster, a lot has to be said in a lot fewer words. Um, especially if you're depending on the length of the story too. Like the shorts that I write for the, the patron backers are around a thousand words and there's a lot of information that has to go in there and like I'm I'm beta reading some short stories uh, for a friend of mine but those are like 19 pages um, but that's way different than a 150 page novella or a 300 page book like you have time to say things in in novels and you have time to like leave the breadcrumbs but you don't have that time in short stories so the framing is so much different. So if you're not familiar with, like intrinsically, with how those things work, they don't translate. Um, but if, if like, I know you're a big reader, Megan, so like, and even if you watch movies versus sitcoms, like that's the same idea. You have more or less time, the framing is different, the timing is different. So you, you can learn from both of them to inform the other, but one is not a building block to the other. I learned that the hard way, like everything. How likely are you to end up using your fan base for evil? About 50-50. I tend to try to use my powers for awesome. Um, I'm going to go back to the... To my list to make sure Katie gets one of her questions answered. She's got five. Uh, she, one of her questions was about the the book, the book Bible. So I'll touch up there. Oh, here's a good one because this has actually changed for me recently. How do you balance the sobbing versus cake eating when you get feedback? <laughs> Even if so much is positive, I feel we writers manage not to focus on what on that when there's criticism. Uh, so, critique is really hard. Um, when I got, it used to be that when I, I would get critique on papers in high school, I would just like motherfuck the teacher and like in my mind, of course, I wasn't that kid. But I, I was like, oh, you know, I, I knew everything, right? Um, but then when I wrote Ink Changer, I realized that this was a little bit different. <laughs> and so when I sent it out, I sent it out to five people to beta read and get a critique, which, number one, was a mistake. Because I hadn't, I had sent it to too many people and I didn't have thick enough skin yet. Like I, I didn't have, not a thick skin, you don't want a thick skin. Because that implies that you are immune. And at the point that you're immune to critique, you failed. Because you that, that means your head has swelled so large that no other information can get in. What you need is experience. You need to learn, like, to, to really, this sounds so woo-woo. You need to learn what's, to, to compare what's being said with what's in here because you know what's wrong with your book. You know. And, but it, it like, the first one, I, I cried every time somebody sent me feedback, all five of them. Um, and the critiques were harsh. I had, I, I think, 110, 110 uh, comments on Ink Changer. And most of them were negative, like chronology, characterization, point of view, tense, um, theme, all everything, everything. And the book's only 150 pages. So it's like I've had almost a comment a page, rough. Um, and I angsted and I wailed and it took me a long time to edit and revise because I, I just obsessed and but I learned and so there was a lot there was a lot of sobbing and no cake eating um, 
But this book, Doing Sword of Souls, I had way less comments, which means I learned something about writing books. Like that to have my primary beta reader give me 70% positive feedback and 30% criticism of things that I knew that, that were not news to me. Um, that was so affirming, both of my career path and to notice that the things that I was hurt about, where I, you know, I took that blow to the ego, that I didn't, I didn't have a meltdown. And that I was actually excited to go in and fix these things because I knew that I was on the right track. And so there's, there's, there's a learning curve that you have to, that you have to find. And the only way to, to learn that skill, because it really is a skill, is to just continue to subject yourself to criticism. <laughs> but what I, one of the valuable things that I did was find out who I needed to get feedback from, what kind of feedback I actually needed. So I have one primary beta reader, Katie's out there, this is Katie's question, um, who's read everything that, that I've written. And out of the goodness of her heart, and she needs a medal. Um, I'm, I'm going to get one made this time. Um, because now we have a rapport. Much like you get with an editor in traditional publishing, you learn, you learn what's, you know, what, what's, what's really being said. Because sometimes our reactions aren't the same as in person as they would be on paper. And so, so things get misinterpreted. But you learn how to deal with each other. And you learn each other's quirks. And you like in, in the editing process. And so it's really helpful to have at least one consistent person because it makes it easier to ask questions and get clarification and have feelings. So cake eating, cake eating has commenced this time, but it has not always been that way. I will never stop asking good questions. Okay, Eddie. Um, okay, so a couple people have asked about Patron, Megan, Megan, you also have too many good questions. Okay, 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 okay. All right, let me let me double check my. I just realized. Uh, let me. I need to check the, the Facebook page. I just realized I was totally ignoring it. Um. Let me refresh that. Oh my God, it's already eight o'clock. Um. So I was gonna. Only go to eight o'clock. I don't know why I do this. My these always go long for me. I just keep talking. Can somebody tell me if they like? Do you guys want to go longer, or do you want to cut this off? And I'll save these. The I have a huge list of questions in the sidebar here. Do you want, do you want to keep going for a little while longer, or do you want me to save them up and I'll I'll post them in a different video someday? Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. I can't see if anyone's saying anything. Okay. Oh, so he's asking about the cats. <laughs> uh, no, we actually got doors in the house except for the bathroom doors, so they're not locked up anywhere. They just are. They must be under the couch or something. Like I took away their paper bags so that they couldn't be obnoxious. But I don't know. I think they're sleeping. They're probably mad because I haven't fed them yet. Um, let's see, let's see. <laughs> uh, Zach asks if there's any indie web comics or other kinds of online publication that I've seen recently and would like to recommend. <laughs> it's funny that you ask me that because I get all of my indie recommendations from you. Um, so I, I've actually... It sounds terrible. Like I've been really bad about picking up new stuff because I've been just balls deep in my own work. Um, but like I just finished Blue Blazes by Chuck Wendig, which is so good. It made me wish that I hadn't started writing Forgotten Relics because the world that he's created is so much better than mine. <laughs> um, and as far as like web comics and stuff go, uh, I really want to finish reading A Girl in Her Fed 
which to me feels very much like the Cora and Jack relationship, and so I'm, I'm curious to do some research there. I just got into Happy Jar, and I, I, I read questionable content and Girls with Slingshots and, um, you know, XKCD, like, you know, your, your, your standard webcomic nerd fair, um, Saturday morning breakfast cereal. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm more, you know, mainstream indie than actual indie. So if you would like to jump into the, uh, the Facebook comments section and recommend some things that are online indie publications that, that you think, you know, Forgotten Relics fans would like, please do jump in because that would be good for me and them. Okay, Eddie. All right. All right. Eddie says, what's the one thing you hate about self-publishing and the one thing that you love? I don't think I'm going to say anything different than anybody else who gets this question. The thing that I hate about self-publishing is that I have to do it all myself. It is the thing that I love about it is that I have to do it all myself. It's, it's very much, um, you know, a bittersweet sort of thing because on the one hand, it's, you know, I don't have an editor, I don't have a publisher, I don't have an agent, I don't have a publicist, I don't have a marketing team, I don't have a designer, I don't, like, I don't have any of that stuff. And so it's on me to do it and to fund it. Um, and unfortunately, that means that I go without some of that stuff. And it does mean that there is a certain amount of my energy and my well that's taken up with, with with those those business things instead of stuff that I could be using for creative work instead, but I have complete control over everything that I'm doing. So I can change my business strategy. I can change where my book is sold. Like there's been a lot of stuff going on with Amazon lately, and I won't get into it. But it's like if I decided that I didn't want to do business with them anymore. I could take my book down. I could sell it directly from my site. I could sell it just on Kobo. Um, I can't sell on Nook because I have a weird legal situation being American and Canadian. Um, but I, I also get to do more guerrilla style marketing if I want to. I get to choose my designer. Like that's, I am so excited. I'm so happy that, that I get to work with Des. And I'm so looking forward to the day that I can that we hit that level, that $750 a month level with with the patron campaign where I can hire her full time and we can do whatever we want because I can pay her. Um, I get to I, I own all of my property rights. Like nobody else owns that property. So it's a it's a double edged sword. Um, and the thing that I love most about it is also the thing that I hate. Do, 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 do. Cleaning up the list. Make it into a series. Make it into a series. Make what into a series? Um, Liz. Hi, Liz. Liz has been super, super, super helpful with getting the patron campaign together and is quite the super fan. She says, "What's your favorite trick for keeping home decompressed time and work separate?" Um, I don't really have a trick. Like, the trick is that my husband leaves and goes to work. <laughs> I don't, like, that's, that's pretty much my marker. Um, I start work after he leaves, and I stop work before he gets home. Um, I used to, when I was, when I was still tutoring online as my regular job, it was difficult to do that because, the hours that I had available would overlap. And so there was, like, I would be sitting here at the computer working, and then he would come home and want to talk to me. And so there was no line between work and, and downtime. And that sucked. And that was one of the things that I made sure to do when I was able to quit that job was that I needed a container for a work day. And having that has made everything way less stressful because I, I know that I work between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day. That's it. And then and it helps me remember that I've got to be able to, to draw that line and to leave work for tomorrow. It keeps me from, from going over and over and, and obsessing that I should be working, I should be working, I should be working. Paycheck makes up for criticism. <laughs> 
paycheck might make up for criticism if the paychecks were bigger than 69 cents. Published work two years after. Uh, keep going. Just, just Fox says keep going. Okay. I obviously have chosen to do that. Um, save them for later. Um, yeah, if... <laughs> um, we'll, let's go until... Let's let's call it let's call it 8:30. We'll we'll start to wind down at 8:30, um, so in about 30 minutes. Um, and the video will be available. I'm gonna chop the the rough beginning off of it, and it'll be up on YouTube, and I'll definitely share it out. So if you guys need to go, please go ahead and go. If you have questions you want me to answer during this, just leave them there. And anything that I don't get to, um, one of the things that we do on on Patreon is a monthly Q and A video, and Right now, we don't have any questions. Um, usually, it's available to, like, access to that question list is only available to $10 a month and up backers. But I want to make sure that we're actually producing them and that I do what I say I'm going to do. Um, so I'll save them, and we'll, I'll do another one later. That's just me talking to the camera. Um, Okay, so Zach, Zach, you're excused. You can go if you want. Um, let me clean up the, the sidebar here. <laughs> oh, make the AMA questions into a series. Yeah, I've I I've seriously considered doing that, like um, holding on to them because I get asked a lot of the same questions when I do these, which I'm totally fine to answer. I love talking about it, but I do struggle with blog posts. So I, it's like, duh, why don't you just write the answers to, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Oh, I see. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I just noticed that the Q and A is ranked. So I guess you guys can like each other's questions and like the more likes they have, the, the higher it goes in the ranking. I didn't know that. Uh, that's handy. Okay, so the one on the top now is uh, another question from Eddie that says, "Favorite actor to play Sherlock Holmes?" I get asked this a lot, actually, um, and it's a really hard question for me to answer because I turned into a bit of a Holmes nerd uh, about five or six years ago. My um, when I guess that was when the first Robert Downey Jr. movie was getting ready to come out, and my dad has a compilation from like 1930s something. It's this giant tome with these teeny tiny like Bible style thin pages of the entire thing. Like all four, I think it's four novellas, Eddie will correct me, and all the stories. And I, I read it right before Christmas, so right before the movie came out. And then I started really digging into it. Like I had listened to the radio plays with um, uh, Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and I had seen a couple of their movies, but like I've never seen a Jeremy Brett one. I know that makes me like some kind of blasphemer. Um, and I haven't seen Elementary. Um, what's his name? Johnny, Johnny, Johnny something. Um, so it's it's difficult for me. To, like people don't want to take me seriously because I haven't seen all of them, but I did like the Robert Downey Jr. portrayal, but. I am an enormous fan of the Benedict Cumberbatch portrayal. I feel that he has managed to balance the the humanity that Watson saw in him in the story and the 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 hard exterior and the 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 actual serious sociopathic problems that he has that that Holmes has. Um, I just finished watching the third series of Sherlock and. While it was very squeaky for me, um, yes, just be very pleased. I finally finished watching the third series, so now you guys can talk to me about it. Um, I felt like they went too far, that he was made a little too soft. But um, So Benedict Cumberbatch has been my favorite so far, although Basil Rathbone, when people say Sherlock Holmes to me, that's who I think of. Like with, with the deer stalker and that big pipe. And, and everything, the hook nose, that's, to me, that is, he's the iconic look for Sherlock Holmes, but I think Cumberbatch has done the best job of, of portraying him. Um, more scotch. 
Megan says, I saw the Ink Changer had close to 500 free copies downloaded on Monday. Congrats. Is that something you would consider doing again? So I was totally blown away by that by the response to the free day. I I follow Johnny Vitrin and Sean Platt and David Wright on the self-publishing podcast, and they are huge proponents of doing free stuff. Because what it does when you when you offer your stuff out for free is it gives people an easy end. So in, in business terms, we call it your funnel. Like you, you want a really easy entrance point so that they can grow into the rest of your product line. And the trick to that is having it when you're an author is having a big library. Because if you only have two books and you have one for free, they're going to get the other one, which is nice. Most of them will, maybe 10%. Um, I said most of them will, 10%. In business terms, 3% is a good turnover rate. And my, my turnover, because like I was saying before, you guys are so dedicated and on site, um, my, my turnover rate is closer to 15% because you guys are awesome. <laughs> um, so I, I knew that that was a good business strategy, but I was really resistant to doing it. I, I didn't, honestly, it's because I was greedy. Um, I, I was like, I know I have to get paid for my work, and I worked really hard on this, but now that I have some distance from that first book, and because it's short, and because it's a quick, like, punchy read, it made a lot of, like, I'm okay with not getting paid for it. Like, and it was just one day. Like, come on. Like, how fucking greedy are you going to be? Um, and I think I've, it, it sold at least, like, people downloaded twice as many copies in one day than had been sold altogether in almost two years. So, in a year and a half. Um, so that's amazing, like, and because what that means is that it, with that high turnover rate, like, we're going to start seeing new people coming into the fold. We're going to see new people in the Facebook group and, and new people joining the team. Whether or not they buy more books, like, immediately, that's kind of irrelevant. Like, my interest is building our community. Um, like, I, my, like my, my not-so-secret goal is to have that Seth Godin 1,000 true fans. Like, at that point, I feel like we're going to have a vibrant enough community that there's a lot of different things going on and that I'm going to be supported and that there's enough enough people out there that you guys can all be connected and that there's an actual community there that, that is this big and vibrant, a village instead of, like, an encampment. Um, so, yeah, I would absolutely consider doing it again. Um, I am doing some free promotions in the future. Like, once Sword of Souls comes out, I may make Core Riley free for a day um, to garner interest in people buying it later. Um, Sword of Souls comes out in December, by the way. Um, and the like, there's free promotions going on in the, the, pa the patron community. Like, part of it is that... Um, in the milestones, some of some of the milestones are audiobook related. Um, some of them are, and, and like I'll give copies of, of those away for free to to those the to the community, um, and the as well as the short story collection every year. I'll I'll give those away to people in the community, um, but I'm trying to to pull it in. So on Amazon, it could be either way. Um, now that I have this experiment under my belt. It seems like a good idea. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Jess has been on me to watch the end of Sherlock for quite some time. Johnny Lee Miller, thank you. I could not think of that guy's name. Uh, Tina, I, I, I covered the basing characters off people in real life, kind of, when we talked about life experiences. They, yeah, definitely, you you definitely bring people and characteristics from your real life into into your stories. Like, you just don't have, like, <laughs> it's hard to have a big enough imagination to create people from scratch. Like, and if you, like, just go sit in an airport for an hour and see what happens. Because those, like, you see the strangest and most interesting things if you just sit still in a public place for a while. And... If, if you have that storyteller brain, you just start making stuff up about them. Especially if you watch Sherlock, because you start thinking like Sherlock. It's like, oh, look at this person, and 
what do I know about them from the way their shoes are scuffed or like, you know, this woman's lipstick is running. Like, how do you, what do you think about that? And so you start making up stories about people that you see and it, it provides great backdrop and, and, and characterization for your fiction. Do, 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 do. Johnny Lee Miller, Eddie got mad at me too. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, um, Oh, the cat did come out. Just that's a warning. Um, sobbing versus kicking. Let's see. Character names. Oh, so related to that, Allison asked about character names. Um, do you have a way that you come up with them? Has character name ever just popped perfectly into your head without research or pondering? I suck at naming things. People, places, objects, <laughs> cats, like. I just, I'm not good at it. And what I wound up doing for, like, Zara, Zara Carter's name just came to me, and so did Sophie's. But, like, Cora had to do some research. Like, if you think about it for a while and you have a mythology background, you'll understand why her name is Cora. Um, Jack, Jack's name turned up because I needed, I wanted him to have a perfectly plain name. If, if you read... In Cora Riley, he actually has two middle names, and all four of his names are are plain everyday first names of Americans. Um, and that's actually going to come to play in the third book. So in Mirror of Ashes, the one that comes out next year, there's we're going to be digging really deeply into to to Jack's backstory. Um, so you're gonna have to wait. Um, otherwise, if it's just a background character, honestly, I stole Karina Cooper's idea, and I just go to IMDb and look up movies that I like, and look at their their cast and crew list for minor people, and like you know the the lighting guy. So I just pull names from there because I my it's just not worth the brain energy. <laughs> Weird things in public places in Sherlock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Walmart's another good place to look at, at people and wonder. Four novels, 56 short stories. One really short story that most people don't know about. What's the short story that most people don't know about? The home short that nobody knows about. Um, <laughs> Ellie DiGiulio has asked me some things as long as you're not being too repetitive or weird the web series. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Jeremy March says that Jeremy Brett is the best Sherlock he's ever seen. A lot of people agree that Jeremy Brett is is the best. Um, I, Eddie, I can't remember if he was number one on your list. I think it might have been Johnny Johnny Lee Miller. Um, but I remember you ranked yours once, and I think it, Jeremy Brett and and Johnny Lee Miller were competing. Um, I got a couple questions here about about patron. So the first one's from Megan. Are you planning to compile the patron short stories for sale at the end of the calendar year to non-patron backers? Yes. So what'll happen with those is, uh, if you don't know, I write a, I have been writing all year, one short story a month, um, about a thousand words. I think the last one was seventeen hundred, um, and sending it just to the inner circle. So when I still had a newsletter. Uh, for about six months, I sent it to them and nobody else. And then now that we have the, the patron campaign, the patron backers get it. If you pay, if, if you're signed on at the $3 a month level, you get that month's short story plus a bunch of other stuff. And if you're at $5 per month, you get not just that, but you also get access to the archive. So you can see all of the ones from the past. Um, and you also will get a free copy of that year's compilation. So all 12 of the stories, there might be a bonus 13th story, just, you know, screw with people. Um, but that will be for sale in, in the Amazon store for like a buck or two. I haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, it'll be for sale to the public um, probably the week after Sword of Souls is released. Sword of Souls is slated to come out December 4th. Um, so it may very well be that it'll come out the week after, or it may come out January 1st. I'm not sure. I haven't figured that out yet. But it will be available for public sale, but you get it for free if you're if you're one of the backers. And he says, how Watson learned the trick was the very, very short story. 
I'm writing that down. <laughs> I'm actually, I told, I shared this with Eddie um, not too long ago because I know he's such a, a big a Holmes fan. I had this like mind blowing, like you would think that somebody was smoking dope and like, does anybody say that anymore? Um, you know, smoking a joint and like, dude, what if? I had this really crazy idea about Sherlock Holmes, so I've, I've got the, I've got a, a Holmes project on on the download. I just got to figure out how to make it work. Um, it's kind of a Sherlock Holmes meets Fight Club kind of thing. I'm not really sure how to make it work, uh, but look out for that. Uh, and Jess Lee wants to know if I would recommend Patreon even for published types. Absolutely yes, because. As long as you're not violating your contract with your with your traditional publisher, it's a way for for your people to connect with you, and you can write more stuff. It's um, like even to just do something like what I'm doing. Like you, if you're like for you, um, for you, uh, there's it's tricky because you probably can't use the the world that you're currently writing in with that publisher because they own that IP. But if you have another idea that you've been wanting to work on, you can totally do that through Patreon because you have, like, the fans of your published work are going to be interested in other stuff that you're doing. And part of the reason I did this is because I didn't want people to have to wait a year between books that I'm writing to get cool stuff. So, like, absolutely. I would absolutely recommend that people that are traditionally published see if they can find a way to, to make Patreon work for them. Because it's all about connecting your, you and your people um, and, and making cool stuff. So do, 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 cleaning up the sidebar. <laughs> okay. All right. We only have a few more questions. So I think I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and answer these. And then we'll be done because we got about 15 minutes left. Um, Megan asked how hard it is to come up with the ideas for the short stories. Um, really hard harder than I thought when I said I was going to start doing it. I thought for sure that I was just going to have a zillion ideas and I was going to write, I, I thought that I was just going to write them all at once because it's like, oh, it's only like 12,000 words. That's not even, that's not even anything. Um, way harder than I thought. Uh, I've asked, like, I'm, I'm, for those of you that are on the Facebook page, you see me ask. Like, what, what do you want me to do? Like, I have some ideas, but I want, again, I want them to be interesting for you. Like, I, I want them to be things that you're curious about. And I would love if if you guys, like, on the Facebook page or definitely in, in the Patreon group, like, if you ever have an idea, if there's something that you want to know, ask me. Like, I would think that this has been pretty clear that I'm pretty forthcoming with that kind of stuff. And sometimes it's stuff that I hadn't considered. Like my mom wanted to know how um, how Susanna and, and Daniel Riley met Cora's parents because it's revealed at the end of Cora Riley that there's something really special about Daniel that makes Cora special um, that she inherited it from him. And so she was curious. My mom was curious about that. And so that was actually this month's story, which I hope you guys liked. I, I haven't gotten any feedback on it yet, but I'm really curious to see how that went over. Um, but yeah, so if any like, if there's something you want to know, just let me know because again, I don't have a plot bible, so it's all in my head, and so it's been fun for me to get some of that stuff out and just kind of explore it on my own and find out what I actually think. Oh, let's see. Shanae says she's writing a web series in the background, but she wants to keep up a writing habit and writing things, and she doesn't know how to do both. Yeah, I don't honestly. I don't know, man. Like, I need to have clear, delineated boxes because I, I tend to get, I just get overwhelmed. I, I'm like, no, but I have to do this, and then I tend to do the things that are shortest first, but not necessarily the things that are the most pressing. So, like, editing a novel, but I need, it takes a long time, and it's really pressing, and it's, it's really important. But then I have short stories that I have to do, like I was just talking about, and it's like, that needs to be done first. Even if I am more invested and more interested in doing the novel, I have to do the thing that, that is due first. And I know a lot of authors, 
that, that juggle multiple projects, including submissions. And um, like um, Jessica Mihu writes, um, she's, she's doing a story a week. And she has to submit it to somebody. It's not just a thing she's doing for funsies. Um, and that, that's intense. But it's, it's all about boxes. You have to figure out what your, your work style is. And I know a lot of people have good luck with the Pomodoro technique where you have the little t egg timer and you set it for 20 minutes, you do the task, and then you take a break, and then you do the task, take a break. Um, so, yeah, just you just got to start playing with your workflow. That's what I'm doing, trying to figure out how much I can do and what amount of time and, and what's actually pressing and what's not. Oh, we're almost done. <laughs> All right, Jess, Jess is heading out. I, we've had a couple people drop off, so good night. Anybody who's on their way out, thanks for coming. All right, we got two more questions. Uh, Megan wants to know, uh, I've got uh, the convention tomorrow, so Con Bravo here in Hamilton. It's, um, it's a kind of a cosplay transmedia sort of thing. I've, I've not actually gone to this one, even though it's right down the street. Uh, but I have a vendor booth, and then Fan Fan Expo in Toronto in August, which is huge, thousands and thousands of people. And I'm not doing panels. I did panels at Ad Astra in May, April, April. Um, and she wants to know how much preparation went into that. Um, honestly, not a whole lot. It's it was more a matter of of getting the money together and finding somebody to to help share the table because. I didn't want to be stuck there by myself or alone or have to pay for all of it by myself. But like I had to order books and then like I posted that picture before I bought a banner, which made me feel all kinds of special and, and, and cool. But not a lot of prep has gone into it. Honestly, I have been evolving my social, like going out and my in-person presence stuff just by doing it, like doing stuff like this, which has been really helpful for growing my extroversion skills. That, to me, takes way more preparation, like getting ready to, to deal with a lot of people. And honestly, because I'm selling stuff, to deal with rejection. Because people aren't people don't always buy from you, and they look at your stuff and have a great conversation and walk away. You never hear from them again. So I've got some, I've got postcards, and I've got some welcome cards. Like there's a, a brand new welcome page on, on LED.com. So it's like LED.com slash welcome. And it's kind of a, 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 a primer. So you go in and find... The, the patron link and the, the newest book and a little bit about me and some blog posts to start with. And so that was, I think that's going to be good. We'll see how it goes. I'm just kind of like rolling with it, you know. Um, but it is exciting to do conventions. Like I feel like I'm really stepping up my game. So if, if you guys are going to be around, if you're going to be at Con Bravo, if you're going to be at Fan Expo or the Geek Art Show in um, November in Guelph, please come and see me. <laughs> please. Um, last question, guys. Um, Tina asks, what's easier for you to write, fiction or nonfiction? They both have their own challenges. Um, nonfiction is, is challenging because you're setting yourself up as an authority. And if you don't own your subject, like if you don't really actually feel the cat escaped, um, if you don't really actually feel authoritative, people can tell. And, and uh, it's but it, at the same time, it can be easier than fiction because it's either your opinion or a fact-based thing that you can go and research. So it's at that point, it's a matter of style, like the way that you write. I had a lot of compliments about my nonfiction articles when I was doing life coaching because I have a very definite style, and people really responded to that. But you are hemmed in by reality unfortunately. And so in fiction, it's fun because you can just make shit up. And it doesn't have to, like, all it has to do is conform to the rules of that world because that's all that matters. It doesn't have to be real. Um, and tone, while tone and style do matter, um, like, you have to be careful with too much opinionating. Like, if it becomes clear that you're just pontificating as, a, as the omniscient narrator and, like, a character doesn't own those those opinions, then it gets way out of hand and you just can't do that. So they have their own challenges and they're both satisfying in different ways. And some people are better at one than the other. Um, I feel like I'm I'm kind of 50-50. Uh, I really 
I, and I would like to get back into writing more nonfiction. I'd like to do more writing about writing on the blog, and I think any suggestion to use these questions as blog posts to talk to people about writing, because I know a lot of you have those questions, and people that didn't show up today have those questions. Uh, so I, I'd like to get into there. It's just that owning your authority thing. So the queue is clear. Amazing. Now somebody is going to be a smart ass and post a thing in the Q&A. Um, I'm sad that we seem to have lost Kylie because I know that she usually has a lot of questions. Um, oh, goodness. I'm going to check the Facebooks really quick. Cat ate my eyeballs. Okay. Um, you guys. Uh, let's see. Let me just double check. Al has a said, I just missed it. Oh. Okay. All right. So... I think that's it. I had a few left on the, the question list, but I think we're going to go ahead and, and ring it out So because it's 5, 5 to 30. Thank you guys so much for coming. This was really fun. I, I always get really nervous <laughs> before I start because I feel stupid looking at myself and talking out into the dead air where there's kitties here and that's it. They've just come out to start playing because they want me to feed them. Um, but thank you so much for all your questions and for all your support. And um, in case it, it wasn't clear, I am super grateful for all of your support, uh, not just of me and of my books, but from the, the patron campaign. You guys are really helping me to, to transform the way that I think about, you know, about, about uh, you know, being an author and having fans and, you know, turning a business model into a communication model and a connection model instead of, you know, that greedy thing that I was talking about where uh, why I wouldn't put an ink changer on free before. And, like, you guys are helping me to be more generous, and it makes it makes me a better person, which makes me write better books, honestly. And, and you know, this kind of connection just really feeds me, and I'm so grateful that you guys show up for this and that you spread the word and you're enthusiastic, and I just I wouldn't trade you for the world. So... Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a good night. For those of you in the UK that stayed up this late, you guys deserve extra bonus brownie points to whichever Hogwarts house you identify with. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to edit this and just chop the weird ends off of it, and then it'll be up and, and shareable on YouTube, uh, hopefully sometime tomorrow. So thank you guys so much. Good night. I love you, and I will see you around the Internet. Bye.